This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. There are, as you are probably aware, uh, several schools of thought within Marxist political economy, and frequently they don't really communicate with each other very much. Now, in past podcasts, I have uh, mentioned two of them. One of them is the group that concentrates its attention on the falling rate of profit. Uh, And that is uh, rather different than the group that uh, uh, concerns itself with uh, the rising surplus and the problems of disposing of that rising surplus. And I've complained in a way that uh, what happens here is that these two groups are, in effect, taking one side of a contradiction that is central to Marx's thinking, which is that between a falling rate of profit and a rising mass of profit. And that uh, what one group does is to talk about the falling rate and the other examines the rising mass, and they miss the real contradiction that Marx was concerned with, which was the relationship between falling rate and rising mass, and that I therefore thought that we should try to put the two uh, schools together. In so doing, however, I think that there is a very interesting problem as to what it is that separates them. And this has to do with the question of the role of competition. Now, Marx frequently refers in his writings to what he calls the coercive laws of competition. And it is the coercive laws of competition that uh, really force the laws of motion of capital upon the participants, like the capitalists, and also uh, upon the laborers. So the coercive laws of competition are foundational. And they're foundational for the falling rate of profit in the following way, that it is intercapitalist competition uh, over technological advantage that creates the technological dynamism in, so- in society, And that is what creates the increasing productivity of labor. And it is the increasing productivity of labor which increasingly moves labor out uh, from the production orbit and therefore uh, leads to production of less surplus with a falling rate of profit. So the falling rate of profit depends upon the operation of these coercive laws of competition. Uh, The other school of thought uh, which is mainly represented by Baran and Sweezy and the Monthly Review, uh, is looking at the surplus. And Baran and Sweezy made the very direct comment that they thought that the falling rate of profit era was uh, largely over because the coercive laws of competition were no longer operative uh, in a society that had moved on from competitive capitalism to what they called monopoly capitalism. Now, so the two sides, as it were, uh, are separated by their view of what was important about competition in society or non-competition in society. So I want to take this uh, issue up and ask the question, how do the coercive laws of competition work? And in what sense should we see the distinction between those two schools as having everything to do with with, uh, the the particular understanding of the role of competition uh, in capitalism and the changing role of competition as we move from a competitive world into a more monopoly kind of uh, society. Now, the coercive laws of competition, it's a very nice phrase, it sort of trips off, and you can attribute all kinds of things to it, and Marx does do so uh, on many occasions in Capital. But one of the things Marx makes very clear when he does so is that you cannot derive the laws of motion of capital from the coercive laws of competition. That the coercive laws of competition are in fact the mechanism, the driving force, the police, if you like, uh, uh, which creates uh, the falling rate of profit. In other words, the whole laws of motion themselves are driven by the coercive laws of competition. But the coercive laws of competition do not dictate the laws. In other words, the coercive laws of competition are the enforcer of the laws of motion of capital, which always leads one to ask, well, what happens 
if the enforcement mechanism le- weakens? What happens if, it's, if it goes uh, AWOL? What happens if it no longer exists? And that, of course, was what Baran and Sweezy were suggesting, that the coercive laws were no longer there and that therefore capital was not working in the same way uh, as it was in when the world was much more competitive. So let's look more closely at how comp- competition works and, and the like. And Marx at one point makes a very interesting kind of comment in which he says, you know, as soon as you start talking about competition, you have to face up to the fact that liberals praise it to the heavens and socialists damn it to hell. The point here is that Marx, I think, felt that competition was neither good nor bad in itself. The important question was, what was competition about? And I would follow that position if if we want to compete in the Olympics, if you want to uh, compete in a chess tournament or a dance competition. Competition seems to be, uh, you know, uh, quite benign in many circumstances and quite thrilling to engage in. So one doesn't want to say all competition is bad or get into the idea that socialism is a world without competition because, no, the competition would be there and, and, and could obviously be organized in very benign ways. Wouldn't it be nice, for example, if cities competed with each other in terms of the efficiency of their health service and, 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 and how well they dealt with the pandemic and, and so on and so on? In other words, competition is, there are all sorts of healthy forms of it and good forms of it. Uh, and we therefore have no reason to damn it to hell as some uh, socialists do. So what this suggests then, however, is that we should be very careful in saying competition about what? And and clearly in, in, in the economy, it's competition for economic advantage. And that is where the problem comes from. And competition for, for economic advantage uh, is crucial because that is where, as I've already mentioned, the dynamism of capitalism comes from. That is why competition forces uh, uh, capitalists to employ workers in certain kinds of ways. Uh, for, for example, uh, if a, a benign employer decided that they, they would like to offer uh, workers uh, a, a lot of money for a sort of three-hour day, and that person comes up against competition with somebody who offers very little money uh, with, a, with a 12-hour day, then clearly uh, the, one with the, tr- the second one wins and the first one loses, so that this is where the coercive laws of competition come in, that it forces certain employment practices, even against individual capitalist will. And this was, again, one of the points that Marx and, and actually even Adam Smith and Ricardo made, that competition forces the abstractions of capital to become real within the production process and within the market. So, Let's look a bit closer about how, how this competition works out. And I think uh, just, 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 I'm going to work backwards uh, on this and, and ask, first of all, how does competition in the market work? Now, clearly, competition over goods and services in, in, in the market is going to be partly led by price. That, that, that's how it's, it, it's, it's really set up. So we're competing for lower prices and, and, and therefore the price in the market is, is, is going to be established through intercapitalist competition. So a particular good in the market will have its value and have its price um, as a result of this competition between many producers producing the same kind of product. Now, the assumption here is that production is of the same kind of product. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. The second thing that's important is the mass. Uh, the mass is important because uh, there are economies of scale and so that the production of one, th- one thing as opposed to a thousand things means that the price per unit is likely to go down so that the, the, there's competition over the mass. How much of the market can you command? And if there's a mass market out there and you can com- uh, command most of that market, then you have an advantage over other people. So. There's an advantage on price, there's an advantage by you having more and more mass in the, in, of command in the market. So that's, those are two, two component points. Then, of course, there comes the question of qualities, the qualities of products. Now, here you have two issues in, in mind. One is the qualities of identical po- products. That is uh, the question of, of shirts or something of that kind, uh, the same the same product uh, the, the, the can be there, but one can have better quality than the other, better quality of raw materials, 
better quality of design, better quality. Uh, and qualities, of course, relate very much to human needs. Uh, if you're a, 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 a producer of certain kinds and you need, need certain kinds of drills, uh, which can drill uh, uh, exactly uh, in, in uh, tiles and the like, then you need, you need a, a certain quality of, of drill. And so the quality then becomes very, very significant. And, and, and producers compete with each other over qualities. Uh, what you can do with their particular product and, and what you can do. The second thing is, however, that uh, heterogeneity starts to become important. So that even though we're talking about shirts, we're not talking about shirts of the same thing. There can be sort of uh, shirts for uh, going to the opera and shirts uh, for working in, 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 uh, in the backyard. So, so their, their qualities are really rather different products and product differentiation starts to enter into the picture. And in what degree, to what degree is the homogeneity of products so that the, we can say that those shirts are comparable as opposed to saying, well, they're not really comparable because they're qualitatively different in some way and therefore there is product differentiation. So you have price, you have mass and you have qualities which are terribly important in, in the market. Then come two really problematic uh, questions, which Marx did not deal with because in his day, probably it was not important. These issues were not important except in sort of high-end bourgeois consumption, and that is the question of reputation. Uh, the, the, the sort of uh, question of uh, how how good something is, you look at automobiles. What's the reputation of the different makes of, of, of automobiles? Uh, is it BMW or General Motors or Ford or what, what it is? So reputation comes into the picture. And there are certain reputations at certain historical moments where, for example, in the 1980s, there was a general consensus and a general feeling that Japanese cars were qualitatively different and the reputation of uh, Japanese cars was much higher than it was of US cars and a whole bunch of people would say they would never buy US cars for, for, because they had a bad reputation, didn't last so long and other, other, other kind of questions. So reputation becomes very important. And, and of course, producers start to trade on reputation. Nike builds a reputation. Gucci builds a reputation. And so the reputation of something becomes very, very, very significant in terms of uh, how well it does in the market. Uh, those with good reputation versus bad reputation. And of course, there's a lot of work that goes in to really trying to establish reputation. And then there is something or which has come into actually conventional economics recently, which says, well, when you're looking at the market, you've got to deal with something else, which is called intangibles. Now, exactly what intangibles mean, we don't really know, but there is a point here saying the way in which a commodity is marketed may rest on reputation, but there are certain intangibles that may go with it. So a certain feeling people have about, about things. People intuitively pick up things in the market and look at it and instantaneously like it and are prepared to pay more for it for some reason or other, which you don't really quite know. So in the market then, we have all of these, these, these different ways of, of, of valuation. And, and of course, price and value go together. Mass is very important and very easy to understand. Qualities, yes. Different um, product differentiation, yeah, okay, you can see that. But then you get into reputation and intangibles. And those things are very, very important. So the question is, how does competition work in the market? What is the competition about? If you don't succeed in competing on the basis of price, maybe what you can do is to try to compete on the basis of reputation or compete on the basis of intangibles. That is, the, the, the competition is not simply uh, about uh, the usual kinds of economic aggregates. The competition is about all of those elements and they are substitutable for one another, that uh, vehicles with good reputations and good intangibles can expect, you can expect to get a higher price or have a greater mass of the product uh, for, that, for that reason. So there's competition going on across all of those areas. And the coercive laws of competition then are, are, a, little, are a little bit complicated when it comes to the market because there are all those features in, in contemporary life which need to be taken, taken into account. And then there is, if you like, a second uh, whole, whole arena, 
in which in which we're not looking at competition in in the market in that way. We'll be looking in the technology of of production, competition between in between capitalists over technology. Now, obviously, technology is related to qualities that is produced uh, that are produced. It's related to the price. It's so it's 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 the, the competition over technology, which becomes. I think very significant and plays a, this very significant role in, in the falling rate of profit, because what they're trying to do is to end up with a superior technological organizational form, uh, which when you take the product to market, does all of those things, performs well in the world of price, does well in terms of commanding a mass, does well in terms of qualities, does well in all of those things. And, and much of that is then traced back to, the, to, the, to the, the nature of the production processes and the technologies which are actually used. Precision technologies, for example. When, when cars were made by hand as opposed to or made by automation and, 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 and the like, uh, we ended up with pr less, less precision in, 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 in certain kinds of cars compared to, to, to others. So, so the technology is very significant. Then, of course, there is also this question of the rate of exploitation, which is available from a particular technology before you take the, the car to market. And that rate of exploitation is very much contingent upon uh, the technology which you're using. So there's competition between, between producers over the technology that they use. And, uh, and uh, the producers of new technologies know that, and so they... Uh, when technology becomes a business, uh, they start to come up with new technologies, which they take to producers and say, well, this is going to improve the efficiency of the labor. It'll improve the quality of your product. It'll improve all of those kinds of things. So there is intense competition over competition. And that competition is, 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 very, is, is, is a very important element, of course, in producing the falling rate of profit. And there is finally competition over the inputs into production. That is, if you can drive the price down, uh, of all of the inputs, the raw materials, for example, and the machinery and all the rest of it. If you can drive that down, then you can get much more surplus value. So, so there is a, a real push to do that. And of course, the other thing is driving down wage rates. Uh, so, so there's competition between, between capitalists in terms of driving down wage rates and driving down input costs. And what this leads to is, of course, a great deal of extractivism uh, with respect to raw materials and all the rest of it uh, coming into the production process and competition between producers for cheaper and cheaper inputs, competition between producers for cheaper and cheaper labor supplies. Those kinds of things start to enter in. So the coercive laws of competition then operate in all of those areas, operate in the market, they operate in production, and they operate in terms of the per, what, what capitalists purchase uh, in, in the way of inputs in, into it. So the, the, in, in a competitive society, then, uh, all of those things work together, and you can see how uh, you can look at all of that and sort of talk about uh, the falling rate of profit and say, yeah, well, this is, this is what happens in a, a very competitive uh, uh, society. So competition, then, uh, is, of, is, 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 is of that sort. Now, what happens then when we start to get monopoly? We start to get monopoly. When we start to get monopoly, what this does is it, 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 it lessens the intensity of uh, the need for all of those innovations to be employed and, and all the rest of it. If you have pure monopoly, uh, the monopoly producer will be in a situation uh, of kind of dictating prices, dictating uh, input values, dictating everything, and you'd have a single, you would not have any, any competition in the market. Now, is monopoly capital really that uh, total uh, monopoly? And I think the answer is no. That in the society that, uh, that Baran and Sweezy were, were talking about, they were not really talking about pure monopoly. They were talking about oligopoly. That is the kind of competition that exists between, say, three or four big firms. And when they were writing, they were writing about the United States. And this in itself is very interesting. They were writing about the situation in the United States where there was an oligopoly. There were basically three large auto companies. The three large auto companies were trying to compete with each other across all of those dimensions, on price, on mass, 
on qualities, on reputation, and on, 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 on uh, intangibles. They were competing with each other, but to some degree, the question of price was maybe not so important as many of the other elements. So if you look at advertisements for automobiles on, uh, on the television, what do they do? Do they talk about price? Do they talk about mass? No, they don't talk about that. They really start to talk about reputation, qualities, and intangibles. And they try to get you to, I don't know, associate certain kinds of cars with kind of I don't know, sexual encounters and glorious days in the sunlight and, and, and uh, driving up a mountain and all that kind of thing. So, so you actually, actually spend a lot of time competing with others in terms of the effectiveness of the degree to which you can establish reputation, the degree to which you can cover the intangibles, and the particular qualities that you have in, a, in, in an automobile. And so a lot of the new electronic gadgets which you can get in automobiles and the fact that uh, Alexas can now be incorporated into automobiles and so you can actually uh, put your lights on in, from your car and oh, you know, all kinds of things like that. So, so, so they try to so, try to use gadgets and all the rest of it to try to persuade you that this is the car car for you. So, so the competition does go on, but the competition over price is not anywhere near as fierce uh, in a situation of oligopoly as 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 it is if it's a highly competitive kind of kind of system. So. That, 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 that form of competition is, 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 I think, very, very significant, but it doesn't necessarily generate the same kind of uh, emphasis upon a falling rate of profit because, in effect, the, the, in an oligopoly situation, you would get, as happened in the automobile industry, you would get sort of price leadership. Uh, Ford would raise its, uh, uh, par, its car prices by you know three percent. Uh, well, uh, General Motors would, and Chrysler would do the same. In other words, that they didn't have a, a, a conspiracy. They didn't have a true monopoly, so they would avoid the the the, 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 the challenge of uh, or the charge that they were they were you know extracting from monopoly by saying no 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 we're competing with each other. But in fact, price leadership, they did patent bar bargaining so that the union would, would take on Ford and reach a, an agreement with Ford. And then it would go to Chrysler and it would say, you know, this is what we've got with Ford. Can you match it? And Chrysler would usually follow roughly Ford and then General Motors would follow the other two. So oligopoly was kind of pretty easy because you could raise prices uh, uh, if you raise wages. You could raise prices and, and, and nobody was really going to go against you. So, uh, so monopoly uh, uh, was, was far easier uh, than, than a highly competitive sit situation. And on this point, I would want to make another point, which is also going to come up later, which is this, that when Baran and Sweezy started talking about monopoly and they used Detroit as their power monopoly, which is an oligopoly of three major, uh, they were operating in, uh, under the conditions of the Bretton Woods Agreement. And the Bretton Woods Agreement actually meant uh, there were capital controls and that f the mobility of capital was not that great. And that therefore capital was basically operated within, within the, the terrain of, uh, of the state. So uh, the oligopoly that existed in the car industry was established within the United States. If you looked elsewhere, you would see the same thing in Britain. You would see you know, Renault in, 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 in Peugeot in France. You would, you would see Fiat in, in, in Italy. In other, words, in other words, you had automobile companies that were, were within nation states, and they had a, a certain kind of monopoly or oligopoly status within that, that system of states, and they were never in collision with each other. They were never in competition with each other because of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which made capital export not so easy and, and capital mobility not so easy. Now, all of that broke down uh, in, in, 19, in 1951 uh, when the U.S. Went, across the, the, went off the gold standard and we got floating exchange rates and the Bretton Woods Agreement came apart, in which case at that point suddenly all of the car companies in the world were looking at each other as if to say, oh, well, I, we, could, we could actually start to challenge uh, Detroit. Uh, so the Japanese auto companies challenged Detroit. The German auto companies 
uh, challenged Detroit, and later on the, the Koreans and, 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 and so on. Meanwhile, uh, Detroit was challenging the, the, the Japanese and the, uh, and the German co companies and the British companies and, and so on. So that, for example, under Margaret Thatcher in Britain, all British uh, automobiles disappeared entirely because uh, the Japanese com companies came in and the German companies came in and basically destroyed any British-based uh, automobile industry. It was, was entirely sort of uh, foreign, foreign owned. So again, when we start to talk about monopoly capital, we're not really talking about pure monopoly. We're talking about oligopoly and we're talking about relations between oligopolies, oligopolistic structures and, and, and the like. So uh, what this meant, however, was that the pressure uh, that came from the falling rate of profit was not so strong that profits could always be assured because in a oligopoly situation, you could simply raise the prices. And of course, one of the problems of that was that when big companies like pharmaceutical companies, energy companies, and the auto companies started to do that, if they raised prices, then you got inflation. So what you would have in the, in, in the 1960s was a typical situation in which wages were increasing, uh, the unions were getting stronger, uh, they were demanding more in the way of wages, uh, and, uh, you know, the auto companies and the, and the energy companies were conceding and saying, OK, we'll give you more money, but we'll compensate for that. We'll still keep our rate of profit by raising prices. And they raised prices. And so you start to see rising prices towards the end of the 1960s, uh, because many of the, the oligopolies were ra raising prices in order to allow for, for many of these other, other features. So... There, I think it is wrong to say that the, uh, you can have a theory of monopoly capitalism, uh, which, is, which is purely monopolistic and is not oligopolistic. And it becomes doubly wrong uh, to do it when you start to say, well, actually, some of the barriers to movement, some of the barriers to, to, to capital export and so on, which, which, which are disappearing, well, when they when they disappear, then then indeed there starts to be much more much more heightened competition. So that uh, while Baran and Sweetie were writing in the 1960s, uh, the end of the 1960s, under a regime of Bretton Woods where capital mobility and capital flight and all the rest of it was more is more restrictive. When you get into the 80s, that world has disappeared and things have become much more competitive throughout the whole world. So there is this, uh, this item then, uh, which were this contrast uh, between the two schools about falling rate and, and, and rising mass, because uh, in, 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 in the Baran and Sweezy uh, argument, uh, there is much more surplus being produced, much more surplus value is being produced, much more surplus value is being poured back in. There is the kind of problem of how do you keep the, the automobile market uh, expanding and expanding and expanding, and expanding? And, 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 and so on. So, so, so that, and that involved uh, all sorts of uh, neo-colonial and uh, neo-imperialist uh, kinds of engagements uh, around the world. But you, you move from a world where there was, in effect, uh, protectionism for most countries in terms of, 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 of their capitalist production. And that protectionism played a very important role in, in softening the kind of the competitive intensity which was involved in, in, in which lay behind uh, uh, the falling rate of profit. And so the falling rate of profit uh, uh, in much of the world didn't become so significant because, because you could engage in monopoly uh, pricing. And this was true uh, all around the place. For example, Latin America, just to take a, an example of this, uh, uh, during this period of the 1960s and to the 1970s was engaging in something called import substitution. They were using protectionism of infant industries. So there was a, a vibrant car industry in Argentina and also one in Brazil. Uh, they were not indigenous car industries, but they were branch plants of Ford and, 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 uh, and the like. So that the, 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 the world was organized in a different, different way during the 1960s and up until the 1970s. But after 1970s, when you start to see the full effect of globalization, so you find that the monopoly sector is subject to a sort of wave of competition. So automobiles was one of them. But then in some other areas, 
and you start to see monopoly emerging around particular, particular qualities and product differentiation. The obvious place where this occurs is in pharmaceutical products. If a pharmaceutical company comes up with a particular drug and that particular drug deals with a particular uh, uh, illness or, 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 a, or a particular malady, if that is the case, then what happens is that you can start to have a monopoly price because people need the drug, they've got the illness, they need it, and, and the pharmaceutical company has the right to the drug. And so, uh, the, particularly with patents and intellectual property rights, it can charge whatever it wants for the, for, 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 for the drug. It can say that the drug, in terms of actual production, probably costs 10 cents, uh, particularly if they, they set up manufacturing in China. You can get, you know, drugs for almost nothing in terms of production. But the, the argument is that there's a great deal of uh, research and development which, which went into the production of that drug, and, and you have to capitalize that over time. So something that actually physically costs 10 cents to make should be charged $10. Um, but then people will kind of say, well, you know, we should do monopoly pricing. We'll, we'll, we'll charge $40 for it. So, so monopoly pricing starts to come in when people start to have monopoly control over the qualities. And this is also about product differentiation. This is one of the significant things that goes on in the market and goes on everywhere. That product differentiation is, a, is one of the ways in which capitalists themselves start to avoid competition. Now, here's something very peculiar. Capitalism as a system, and capital in general, is supposed to be about competition. But capitalists themselves hate competition. Capitalists themselves want to become monopolists. Because if you're a monopolist, you have an easy life. You, don't, you, know, you just continue producing and you, you can charge whatever you want. And it's an easy, easy kind of life. There may be an interest in some innovation and you, you kind of figure that you've got monopoly power over this drug. Well, you may as well research and get another drug and another drug. So, so yeah, the, 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 there's some incentive for, 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 for innovation. And there may be innovations in terms of uh, production apparatuses and production mechanisms and so on. So it's not as if innovation entirely disappears, but the intensity of the innovation of the sort that Marx had in mind when he talks about the coercive laws of competition is clearly lessened. But it, it, it re-emerges in these different forms. That is, inter-capitalist competition between, say, the, 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 the big uh, energy companies, uh, the competition between uh, the big auto companies, the big pharma companies, and so on. These com the, the, the competition is still there, but it's, it, but it's a form of a monopolistic competition or oligopolistic competition, which doesn't uh, erase entirely the, the falling rate of profit, but it, it attenuates some of, some of the mechanisms which Marx invokes in terms of, uh, of competition. Now, what this suggests, however, is, is that the, the difference between a competitive situation of the first sort and uh, the, the oligopolistic system the, the tension between them is not as great as many people would, 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 would uh, imagine, which would give another reason to say we should be spending some effort in trying to put these traditions of falling rate and uh, uh, disposal of the rising mass, uh, these two traditions together, to try to uh, develop a different kind of political economic understanding. But it has to be an understanding in which the coercive laws of competition are uh, understood and, 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 and analyzed more, more clearly. Uh, and, and I think this is important because Marx himself, at various times in his writing, said that he had the ambition one day to write a book on competition. Uh, that is, he thought it was important enough to deal with the mechanism, which, which was enfor the enforcement mechanism, needed, needed uh, careful attention. And so what I'm suggesting is that we all of us should think about the enforcement mechanism and, real, uh, and think about how uh, the, the coercive laws of competition actually work in particular situations and to what degree those, those, uh, the, that, that working out is, 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 is producing uh, things like uh, you know, over-accumulation because uh, there's too much surplus being produced, too much there, and so the difficulties of over-accumulation come into being. 
but they are not separate from these processes of falling rate of profit. So the falling rate of profit and the disposal of the surface, surplus then come then very much come together. And I think this is doubly important right now because if we start to sell, ask ourselves the question, uh, what are the main problems which are arising with capital accumulation these days? What, what, what sorts of issues are there uh, which are being set up? And one of the, one of the big issues, uh, of course, is something like uh, environmental degradation, climate change, and all the rest of it. And, and, and you look at it and you say, well, can I get to an understanding of that issue by looking just merely at the falling rate of profit and nothing else? And the answer is, you can't get very far on that, but you can get a long way with it when you kind of say, well, we're not only dealing with a falling rate, we're also dealing with a rising mass. And if the rising mass is a response to the falling rate, then the rising mass is, has a very important role in terms of increasing extractivism of raw materials, increasing problems of uh, uh, shaping uh, consumption capacity, and of course, increasing problems of environmental degradation. That is, uh, climate change is, a, is most closely associated with the problems of the rising mass. But if the rising mass is produced by the falling rate, uh, but the rising mass is going to go on anyway, even under mon monopolistic positions, because there is a form of competition going on within oligopolistic structures. And those oligopolistic forms of competition are, 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 are very, very significant in terms of making a radical transformation in, in uh, the nature of how capital accumulation is working. In particular, uh, monopoly organization frequently uh, is associated with uh, the uh, technological innovation, not uh, coming as a result of competition, but technological innovation, which is coming because large corporations internalize the production of new capacities and new powers. And those are, I think, what, what, we, what we then ask is, is competition a result of coercive laws of competition, or is it because of what uh, Alfred Chandler called the, the operations of the, uh, uh, of the, you know, the, Adam Smith always talked about uh, the hidden hand, uh, and, and Alfred Chandler wanted to talk about the, uh, the, 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 the non-invisible hand uh, of, uh, of corporate power in man, and man, in manipulating societies in terms of the production of new products, new, new mo modes of doing things and the like. In other words, innovation has a different shape and form under oligopolistic conditions than it does under co competitive conditions. So this is, if you like, one of the ways in which we can start to put together uh, those two traditions of falling rate and, and rising mass and start to think of a, a, a political economy uh, which, is, which is combining the two into a full understanding of the dynamics of capital accumulation. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.